uh, you'll recognize this shape, right? This is a wonderful and very profound shape. It's so wonderful and profound that uh, mathematicians have discovered it and rediscovered it um, over the centuries. And it's easy enough that a simple child can be told how to build this, right? All it requires is whole number addition. Um, most of you guys know that the simplicity of Pascal's triangle is um, matched by how profound the patterns are in Pascal's triangle. That's kind of why it's so famous. Um, we know that the binomial coefficients appear in uh, in all of the all the numbers are binomial coefficients. Um, we also know you can find all kinds of things like um, multiples of three, they form weird fractals and that kind of thing. If you've never explored that, you should definitely Google um, fractals in Pascal's triangle. But that's not what I want us to focus on today and it's not um, going to give us a result that we want to prove, which is the goal today. Okay, so Here's the result I want you to focus on. There are, let me just drag this up into the right spot, um, several rows in Pascal's triangle that exhibit a really strange and interesting property. Um, you can see the ones that I've highlighted here. These are the rows of Pascal's triangle where if you just ignore the ones, um, the first term is a prime number, right? So you can see there's two that's prime, three's prime, five's prime, seven's prime. I don't think I've missed any. Um, this Pascal triangle, it goes up to uh, 15, so 13's the last prime that we have there, okay? Um, by the way, Sean, your camera's on, so you may like to switch that off um, since we're still recording, but you know, no big deal, <laughs> it's okay. All right, there we go. Now, I want you to look really hard Look really hard at the rows of Pascal's triangle that I've highlighted, which have prime numbers in them, uh, or that start with prime numbers rather. I want you to have a look at the rest of the numbers in the row, not the prime numbers themselves, but the numbers alongside the prime numbers. I wonder if any of you spot that there's an interesting property that all of those numbers exhibit, right? In the fifth row, all the numbers in the fifth row have a certain property, uh, again, ignoring the ones. In the seventh row, uh, those blue numbers, right? They, those numbers all have a certain property. The same for the 11th row, same for the 13th, presumably the same for the 17th. I just couldn't find a diagram that big. What's the property? Can anyone see it? Would it be helpful if, for example... Of that prime number? Uh, yeah, say it again, Jia. Say it again. Alright, so all the numbers in the same row are multiples of the prime number. All the numbers in the same row... Yeah, all the numbers in the same row are multiples of whatever row you're in, right? So we usually call this the zeroth row, which makes this the first, second, third row. In the fifth row, they're all multiples of five. I mean, it's just five and 10. Same with the 10th row. If I go down to the, oh, there we go, the 11th row, you can see those multiples. And then here is the, um, the 13th row and all of the multiples, right? I claim that this is always true. Uh, that no matter what prime row you go up until, you will always find, ignoring the ones, that all of the numbers are going to be multiples of the prime number that starts off that row. That's my claim. And I'm gonna ask you to try and prove it. Now, I'm gonna give you, um, yeah, I'm gonna give you a few minutes to go into breakouts and I, I'm actually not interested in you writing out a proof. I want you to try and sort of talk through what might be your, your tools um, to try and make a path through this. The writing of it will take too long, I just want you to discuss it, okay? I will give you a single clue, uh, which won't feel like a clue at all, but when I give you my proof, you'll see why it's important. The clue is, I'll let you assume that all numbers in Pascal's triangle are integers. They're all whole numbers. You're like, Mr. Wu, of course. They're made by adding, right? Like we just, we, we take the top two and then we add them and they're all whole numbers from the start. So of course they're whole numbers, right? Um, that'll become a really important piece of the puzzle. So even though it seems trivial, take it and, um, you know, don't, don't question the gift as I give it to you. So right now what I'm going to do and I'm gonna pop you into breakouts and I'll give you, I'll give you four or five minutes to have a bit of a chat amongst yourselves. Where are my breakout room controls? Here they are. So I'm, I'm going to assign you a bit randomly. So if you have any issues with technology, please let me know. Um, but I'm gonna send you in there. I'll bring you back at quarter two, or you can signal to me, you're like, we have no idea what we're doing, or we have an answer, and then we'll come back together to explore a solution. Okay, so good luck. Here come the breakout rooms. Progress. Recording is back on. Just before I show you the solution, I have to tell you there's a teeny tiny story behind this uh, question, um, which is that I actually discovered this pattern years ago. Um, and you can actually see if you <laughs> if you go on YouTube and you search up Pascal's in prime, prime, sorry, 
primes in Pascal's triangle. I'm pretty sure my video is somewhere near the top. Um, and you'll see me show this result with no explanation to an extension two class from a few years back. And um, what was really interesting is that one of my ex students who was not in that class, um, who had become, she was studying mathematics, pure mathematics at Oxford University. Um, she uh, messaged me and said, hey, I like that video. Did you have a proof for it? And I said, back then, actually no. And then she said, well, I'm, a, I'm an Oxford mathematician, so I should be able to come up with one. And she came up with the solution that I'm about to show you. And I liked the question so much, I almost put it into your AP3 exam. But as you're about to see, I feel like it's, it's a little bit cruel to put into exam, even though the question itself is delightful. So I'm on the clock. So let me try and walk you through uh, this proof. This is the claim, right? If P is prime, then, uh, each of the numbers in the rows, row of Pascal's triangle for that prime, so they're all of the form, uh, P choose K, this is us using my binomial notation, should be uh, a multiple of P where, you know, N's a whole number. And also, um, this restriction on K is what helps me ignore the ones on either side, right? Because um, the first one would be P choose zero, and then the last one would be P choose P. So I'm just excluding those because the ones are trivial and they're not that interesting. Interesting. Okay, so how can we prove this? Blink and you'll miss it. I'm not going to write everything, but I will write the important bits. Okay, um, what what does this mean here? This p choose k. Well, we know it's actually shorthand for some factorial notation, right? Um, you might know it as like ncr, and you might have memorized it that way. Um, and this is why it's important to know what's underneath and not just rely on your calculator to do the numerical ones for you. Um, hopefully, if you remember, it's going to be p factorial divided by k factorial p minus k factorial. So my claim is that this is a multiple of p, it's divisible by p, okay? Now the first bit of it, this is not so hard, right? Because you can say, wait a second, I know there's gonna be a multiple of p somewhere in the top because p factorial by definition is p times p minus one times p minus two um, multiplied all the way down until you get to one. So clearly P factorial on its own is a multiple of P. So I can say, i.e. a multiple of P. So that's great if you just think about the numerator. Um, however, the reason why this property only works for prime rows of Pascal's triangle, like if you go back to Pascal's triangle, everything in the eighth row is not a multiple of eight, right? Is because you've got this denominator to contend with, right? If in the denominator you have some number that cancels out, like say eight, right? If you've got like a two and a four or a bunch of twos in here, then they're gonna cancel and you won't be a multiple of eight anymore as several of the terms aren't. So therefore, I need to be able to show not just that the numerator has a factor of P, I have to show that it will never be, it, the, 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 that number P will never appear in the denominator. So it can't possibly cancel. So it will remain up in there in the numerator uncanceled so you have a multiple of that number. So how do we prove that, right? Well, think about this, right? If we think about K factorial, what is K factorial? Um, just like P factorial, it's, oopsie daisy, it's K times K minus one times K minus two and so on. Well, just like before it ends at one. Now, I claim that the number P never appears in this product. No matter what value of K you choose, you're allowed to choose, P will never be one of these numbers in here. Can someone tell me, go ahead and post it in the chat, how can you know that P will never appear somewhere in this uh, series of terms that are being multiplied together? Can anyone give me a suggestion? Have a think, it's even on screen. Any takers? Okay, so Pahan, you are right, but I'm questioning, like there's gonna be prime numbers for sure in this um, sequence, like, I mean, two and three are there, so there are primes in there. Um, and so I know that, uh, I, I'm questioning where the P itself can appear, right? So we'll get to the factorization in a second, but like how do I know P doesn't appear somewhere earlier on, right? Uh, can anyone tell me why? Ah, okay, fantastic. So Sham and Angad, <laughs> uh, famous musketeers together, um, have both noticed, right? I, I restricted here that zero, uh, sorry, K has to be less than P, right? Um, and that's because you can't have like, say if, if I chose a number, right? You can't have 11 choose 20. That doesn't make sense, right? Like how can you choose 20 objects and you only got 11 to choose from, right? So we already knew I'm sort of locked in, right? The K has to be less than P. So therefore, P is never gonna appear in here because it's, it's bigger, it's somewhere over here. It's 
k plus 1 or k plus 2 or something larger, right? Now that's not enough. To go to Pahan's point, right? Um, if say I said, you know, uh, I was, I, if p was 8, which it can't be because p is prime, but if p were 8, I wouldn't need 8 to appear in this product, right? Because if I had, say, this 2 here and a 4, right, then the 2 times 4 will cancel with that 8. But this can never happen for p. Why not? Well, as Pahana said, p is prime. So it doesn't have any other factors that you can break it into, right? So none of the factors of k factorial can multiply to give together, uh, to multiply together to give p, right? So let me write that because it's important. Since p is prime, none of, comma, none of k factorial's factors can multiply to give p. That's what it means to be prime, that there are no factors. Um, and p itself does not appear. p itself is not a factor of k factorial because of that range restriction that we mentioned about k, uh, k rather, um, since k is less than p. So p will never appear in this, okay? Now, once you realize this, uh, once you've sort of pulled this move, you realize you can do exactly the same thing for the other term in the denominator. I'm so confident that you will get this once I fully explain it that I don't need to write it. P minus K, right? P minus K, just like K, um, P minus K has to be less than P because K can't be zero. Um, and so this number is always going to be smaller than P. It might be P and P minus one. P and P minus two, the P minus whatever will always be smaller. So I can pull exactly the same argument here that I did about K factorial. I can say that similarly for, not K factorial, for P minus K factorial. So P will never appear in that factorial, in that product, nor will any of the factors of p minus k factorial multiply together to give p, because they can't, because p is prime. So that's pretty much the guts of the proof, right? You've got this multiple of p from the numerator. You can never have some cancelling of p from the denominator. There's just one piece left, and it's the clue that I gave you right at the start. I've got, uh, oopsie daisy, p choose k equals, uh, I guess I could write it as p times p minus 1 factorial all divided by k factorial p minus k factorial. So you can see in this numerator, that's p factorial. Uh, so I've pulled out the p, so I <laughs> pulled out that. Uh, I've pulled out that very numeral and I claim that this part that I've highlighted in green must be n, right? Now that's actually surprisingly more work than you think and it's why I gave you that clue right from the outset that when we have a look at Pascal's triangle, there are whole numbers, right? So I can just reason on the basis that since all numbers in Pascal's triangle are integers, they're whole, um, since we get them by addition, not just through this multiplication process, therefore I can say, well, this whole thing has to be a whole number and P is one of those factors. So I am done, there's the proof, okay? Now I know I'm a little bit, I'm a couple of minutes over time, so I apologize for that, um, but I hope you can see how important it is to be able to think clearly about, I mean, all this factorial stuff is extension one, right? But the logic that you apply to the question is definitely at a sophistication for extension two. I will leave you with um, one final piece of the puzzle to have a think about. Um, prime numbers, or rather Pascal's triangle, is full of patterns, like we said, and this pattern has to do with prime numbers in Pascal's triangle. But this is not the only place that there's a pattern with primes in Pascal's triangle. For instance, if instead of looking at rows, if you look at diagonals of Pascal's triangle, which start with a prime. So here's the diagonal that starts with two. You might notice, and you're like, well, of course, they're even numbers. There are lots of multiples of two here, right? You can just climb up. You've got all these multiples of two. Then when you have a look at the next diagonal that starts with a prime, you've got three and then six. For some reason, you don't have nine or 12, but then you get 15, 21. You get a whole bunch of multiples of three. In the fifth diagonal, you've got a whole bunch of multiples of five. In the seventh diagonal, a whole bunch of multiples of seven. It feels a lot like the result we just proved with the rows, but with this difference that there are gaps, right? You, you get sort of one, 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 multiple of two. You get two, 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 two multiples of three, four multiples of five. Something weird is going on here. So I leave it as an exercise to the reader and something for you to play around with um, to try and prove this result. I'm gonna tell you right now, 
it's more complicated than the previous one. But even if you don't get to an answer, it's the thinking that you apply that will help you to tackle um, unfamiliar questions and will reduce the amount of times that you'll get into an exam and think, oh, I've never seen anything like this before. Um, well, now you have. So if you do come up with a result uh, with a proof or something like a proof, you're welcome to send it through to Mrs. Lisa or I. I'm happy to have a look at it, build on it, or point you in the right direction.